All right, everybody, welcome into the Fifth Dimension Podcast. For today's show, I am joined by Dr. Nathan Riley, holistic OBGYN, and who Paul Chat calls the real deal MD, which is a <laughs> ringing endorsement if I've ever heard one myself. I don't know if you can get an endorsement much better than that. Uh, Nathan, it's such That's a, a pretty good endorsement. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. If, he, he's call, yeah. if Paul Chet called me the real deal, that might be the highlight of my uh, my pinnacle over here. I, I might just stop. Um, well, if, but, if, if you ever want to know that origin story, uh, it's a really funny story, but I can share that in the show if, if it makes sense. It's a really funny story how I got to know Paul. <laughs> I, I, I mean, we're on it right now. You might as well, you might as well share it if you'd like. I, sure. I would love to hear it. Yeah, I may have told you little snippets of this, and I'll, I'll just tell like the brief version because yeah. everything that, that comes with meeting and getting to know the Czech family and being a part of that tribe is never, it's always long-winded. But uh, basically, I, you know, I'm, I'm a doctor. I, I have two specialties. I'm working on my third, which is not so much conventional. It's anthroposophic medicine. That'll be my third board certification. And um, the reason I say that is that most doctors don't meet somebody like Paul and are like, oh, this guy really gets it. In fact, Paul might sound like he's off in outer space <laughs> the way that most doctors talk to their general social circles. You're not talking about consciousness. You're not talking about the immeasurable, the unseen. You're not talking about psychedelics, let alone doing psychedelics. Most doctors are pretty straight edge. That's how they got through 14 years of school, as I was telling you. Um, school plus training. It's not just like, you know, book work, but um, when I met Paul, his, I had gotten a call from a woman while I was covering a practice, an OBGYN practice in Southern California. And practice is great. It's owned by a guy named Dr. Nick Kapitanakis. Angie Check had had him as her first OB, but she left his practice for her second pregnancy um, to give birth to Zoe, their, their second baby. And she was going to have a home birth and had this great midwife. And of course, I had no idea who the Czech, who, I knew the name. Like I remember the hearing the name Paul Czech, but I didn't really know who it was. I was my head, my head down in the books. So I got this call and she was like, listen, I have to go to the hospital because my midwife says I have really, really high blood pressures. And again, I didn't know who this was, but it was like, this person's going to have a home birth. Now they're going to the hospital. That's pretty scary. Let me go and show up in the way that I show up and just make her feel better. Even if it doesn't mean that we do anything. So I showed up and, and of course she's in the bed and I didn't even notice Paul, but he's like kind of sitting in the corner, sort of just like, you know, looking around and hanging out. And there's this great midwife there. Her name is Nicole Morales. She became good friends with, uh, of mine after this, but I was looking at her blood pressures and they're really, really high. And I was like, what's going on here? Like, she seems like such a healthy person. And this guy in the corner, it presumably is her husband. Like he seems like he's in really good shape. And, uh, you know, it just didn't fit the picture of like a really sick person. And usually pregnancy is not a sickness. It's definitely not a disease. It sometimes just means we need to usher in the baby a little bit sooner. So I was talking to her and I spent like maybe an hour plus with them and, and turned to the midwife and I was like, what do you think? I mean, you know, Angie better than anybody. What do you think? And she already was like, well, that's not what doctors usually do is ask the midwife. But like, I didn't know this person. So I turned to her and asked and we came up with a plan together. And ultimately, Angie had a baby. Um, she was in three days of labor um, and, re and re required a repeat C-section, but they were so impressed with the environment and the, and the surgical suite and I was, it was like a 20 minute surgery, super chill baby went right on her chest. We had music playing. We were celebrating. And I, I had commented Angie while I was in her abdomen. I said, Angie, I don't know what you do. Like, I don't know what your deal is, but your muscle and fascia and tissues are like a 20 year old. I mean, you're a very, you've got really healthy structures. And I, I still, I didn't really know who they were, but Fast forward, Paul gave me a copy of his book and he was like, hey, we really appreciate it. That's the nicest incision I've ever seen, um, you know, closure I've ever seen. And I've worked with a lot of surgeons. I mean, Paul's super experienced. And he was like, here's a copy of my book. And on it, he wrote, we're a team now. And I took it home and I started flipping through it and still didn't put much thought into it because the name of his book is How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy, which if you saw it on like a self-help book shelf, it wouldn't even stand out to you. It's like such a generic name. But I started flipping through and I was like, holy smokes, this guy is doing everything that I've been trying to do in my medical practice, but became so disillusioned with because I couldn't, I didn't have the time or the resources or really even the patience, given how hard I was working to be able to work through people on the physical, the mental, the emotional, and even the spiritual levels. But I was still a beginner in the spiritual space. So he invited me to his house and he, or his office at the, at the time. They'd, they've moved since, but he invited me to this office at the top of this hill with this big sort of scenic va uh, sort of valley overlooking um, overlooking this big valley with all these predatory birds. And 
he was like, come up and I'm going to make breakfast for you. And he showed me his office and he was passing me these like bags of tobacco and herbs. And I was like, Who, what is this? Like, I've never, I've never experienced any of this. So we stacked rocks in his, his, his Zen guard, his, uh, with the Zen Buddhas, as he calls them, these big stones that some of them are like 300 pounds. And I got my stack just as tall as his. And he was like, man, your nervous system is so well trained. And, and, you know, he's like, you given what you bring to the table from what we learned about you, you should do your own thing. Like you should be, come and do some training with us, spend some time with me. Like we'll get your practice up and going and still didn't put too much thought into it. And then after that, we went in and painted mandalas and we he gave me some samples of different drinks people had sent him. And he was like, do you, you know, I know you're on call. Well, I it wasn't technically on call, but I was going to be on call later. And he was like, mm -hmm. do you have time to do some, to go on a journey with me? again, I still was like, duh, what are you talking about? And so we did some 5-MEO and uh, went off into outer space, you know, come back like 20 minutes later after having this like incredible experience. And Paul held my hand the entire time and sang to me the four doctors songs. And he, he related that we're so appreciative of your, of your time and your expertise. And thank you for welcoming our baby girl into the world. And that's where our friendship developed. And since then, I've been fired twice for rattling the cage of the medical system. I won't get into that because I don't really care anymore, but I had already had this idea. Maybe I'll do my own thing. And sure enough, when that happened, Paul said, call me. And I started working on some programs for the Czech Institute. And I started really leaning into what is it? How is it that I want to show up in the world? How is it that I want to show up for my friend, my family, my girls? We have two little girls now since that time. Um, my clients, my friends, my neighbors, et cetera. And uh, Paul and Angie and, and really the, the entire Czech community, Kyle Kingsbury, I mean, all of Alex Rybczynski, Sarah Gustafs, I mean, there are so many people I've met in that space that have really helped me hone in on what is it that I really stand for. And then, of course, over the past two years of COVID, that's when I lost my, or no, three years of COVID, whatever it is, I've, that's when I lost those jobs. It was an opportunity for me to say, you don't belong in this system. And I already had somebody who's, who's almighty and powerful has made a, had a lot of failures, a lot of successes in Paul Cech, encouraging me that like, you, you know, you can do this differently. I needed that final nudge, but now here we are. I'm speaking to great people like you. I'm doing podcast interviews. I got my own podcast and I've got my entire practice up and running. And I, I think I could reasonably say I'm probably the happiest doctor alive, even though I'm not doing a lot of doctor, mm -hmm. doctor stuff anymore, antibiotics and pharmaceuticals and birth control and surgery. So, so it's, that's what brought us together, my friend. <laughs> ah, that's beautiful. It's, it's beautiful how that connection emerged is, and then also the doorways that that opened to really just sort right. of lean into it and ultimately trust in the, the uncertainty of that whole process. Like you said, I mean, most people, if they get fired from, uh, their, their job, their career, you know, it's, that's a, a foundational piece of your identity you almost have to let go of, right? Yeah, and, especially as doctors. Yeah. 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 And, uh, you know, something I do appreciate about you and your work is you say you're a recovering conventional doctor, right? So <laughs> you're, you're, in ways like, you know, I think we have this idea of what a doctor is, what they're supposed to be. You're supposed to play this role, supposed to prescribe this, do that, right? And there's this I guess almost one size fits all model behind how to be a good doctor, how to be a yeah. nurse here. This is the medical system. This is that. Yeah. Right. And it, it, it's fascinating to me because I look at you and I I've never seen a doctor like you. And that's, that's a good <laughs> thing. That's a very good thing. Cause I, I, you know, I'm yeah. somebody who searches outside the box and really uh, like, I don't, I personally, I don't have an individual doctor that I go to because I haven't found anybody that I'm, that is in this sort of space, like in this a space that like you hold or something, you know, sort of has that same vision of health. I'm my own doctor at the moment. And I have Paul checks how to eat, move and be healthy. So I'm using <laughs> that and I'm, you know, integrating the four doctor approach. Um, but, you know, I would, I would, I would love to hear you speak on, you know, you are an OBGYN, but you're also a hospice and palliative care right. doctor. And something we've talked about, you know, I think it was just through Instagram, we talked about birth and death. And uh, this is such an explorative, um, uh, explorative ideas for me personally. I mean, because, you know, I don't have experience in, a, in hospital settings necessarily, or, you know, I don't have any children, so I've never experienced 
the sort of sacred rite of passage that is birth, right? But I, I just through observation, I look at what has taken place within our medical system and see yeah. how I'd say we really have, and something you speak of often is how we have really pathologized this. And it is sort of just a medical procedure instead of something that is very sacred and something yeah. that we can step into. Um, how, how is it that you really, it came to, one, it came to embody the perspective and understanding that you have with the, with the sacredness of these, um, uh, I would say tr transformational initiations is what I would call them. Yeah. Um, and what is it, was there a, sh a, a certain shift that occurred for you at some point in, you know, how you would define these roles of birth and death and uh, ultimately the, the integration that you've had with them. Mm. You know, I, I think a lot of people, they, they speak about, you know, they're like clairvoyant when they're nine and they have these incredible things happen and they realize they can communicate with the dead. And I don't have that type of story, but what I will say is that I was always very, very sensitive to like the ecosystem. Yeah you're out in the woods and you're like, oh man, these trees grow here. And these, these shrubs are down here, probably to keep like the soil in place. And I bet there's a whole, like a bunch of bugs and stuff in there. And like from an early age, I was, you know, I was a boy scout. I was always out in the woods with my family. I just had this appreciation for like, that tree is a living thing. It's not here for my consumption. And as you become a little bit more thoughtful, and of course, when I was a kid, there wasn't a lot of distraction. You know, I didn't have cell phones. I didn't have video games. We were outside and hanging in the trees like little monkeys all day long throwing pine cones at squirrels like we were really in touch with nature and uh, my mom and dad were big gardeners so I was always helping them in the garden and just kind of had that as my upbringing and there was a there was a moment little things started happening where as you pay more and more attention this is actually uh, something that Rudolf Steiner writes quite a bit about which is that if you're if you're able to perceive if you can hone your powers of perception there's a lot more going on out here than merely uh, this physical concrete world. Um, in fact, on a more metaphysical level, like if there's space between your atoms, then this is actually mostly space. And you're just seeing these consolidations, which are either holographic or whatever else like that interests me. But on a very like practical level, I started noticing in the way that Steiner described that if you're paying attention to the tree, like you can actually feel what the tree is feeling. And you get that when you lean up against a tree. And if you're on psychedelics, you get a, a whole portal opens and you can really talk to the trees in some regards. Um, I remember one time I was cutting down the limb of a cherry tree. And I tell this story a lot because it's still so, I'm still so lucid about it. I never used to do any drugs um, even like smoking pot was not a thing I did until med school. I was just like the straight edge, clean kid. We would, you know, drink beers in the woods or whatever, but I wasn't like, you know, getting high and going to raves or anything. So yeah. I, it, I couldn't explain this otherwise, but I was cutting the limb of this tree down and I heard moaning and I was like, oh, the tree must be starting to like ease into this, into gravity, but it wasn't, it wasn't. I stopped the chainsaw and I like still heard it. And it wasn't that like, of a tree limb that's kind of you know testing the integrity of the of the of the base of the tree and so i kept cutting and the sound kind of got louder and then the sound finally stopped and then it was like oh like the limb is dead hmm. and and then i didn't hear anything more and then i chopped it the rest of the way off it was really this funny sensation so the reason i tell that story is fast forward to a life in medicine and sitting with so much birth and so much death it's the same experience of being perceptive in the woods where if you're really paying attention with your heart, with your, with your third eye, with your solar plexus, if you're really in tune with that experience, you start to notice that there's something shifting in there. It's kind of like the way people can describe auras. I don't see auras. I, I haven't honed that skill yet. But in birth, there is something magical happening there. As with death, something changes. It's not that you see a spirit fly away like they show in the movies, although that's yeah. a an illustrated representation of maybe what a person is perceiving. And when I started having those experiences, I was like, God, this is not like, like the way that we're intervening in these processes is not, it's not suitable to how I show up in the world. It's not, 
incongruence with all of these other weird experiences I'd have had in the woods um, in, in the way I was taught to practice it. In fact, what I was observing there was actually validating for what I had experienced in nature. And then fast forward, my first psychedelic journey, as cliche as it sounds, it was the final validation that like, okay, I have not been insane. I'm not imagining these things. I just haven't been able to perceive them. Mm. And when you consider how birth and death are mostly taking place in hospitals with lots of intervention, those interventions distract us from the sacred nature of what this is. And so that's where I wanted to focus the rest of my career was in the sacred unfolding of birth and death, which comes first, who cares? It doesn't really matter. These are sacred rites of passage. And if we don't honor them as that, then people are traumatized in the process. And that's exactly what I think we see um, in the conventional mater maternity care model. We don't know if people are traumatized by the way they die. Although I might, you know, perhaps, perhaps they are. I mean, we can't ask them, but, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, so that's, that really was, was sort of how I started noticing things. Those things started being ironed out of me. It's like, forget about those things. Let's focus on the Cartesian measurable. Uh, let's, let's condense everything down to, you know, mathematical equations or Francis Bacon had said, Hey, your senses are the most easily deceived. Don't trust it just because you think it don't trust it just because you feel it. It has to be computable. It has to be measurable and detectable in this, this, in this, you know, this metric model. Mm -hmm. um, and then having that validation helped me come full circle in, in sort of accepting, okay, there's more than just the physical. That's important as a doctor. But now how exciting that we get to explore these other levels, the other energetic levels of being human. Right, absolutely. And that's really where the truth I've found lies. It's, it, it's not always in the physical material realm. I've had uh, experiences, and I, I told you about this in, uh, when we were talking on Instagram, when I was able to be present when my father passed away and he mm. transitioned and actually witnessing that, you know, at first you have the mind that is going and you want to almost deny the experience when you're within it. And so the mind's going, you're kind of not fully present, but when you accept and you surrender and let go, there was a peace and a tranquility that entered the room. And as that transition happened, it, you know, I, it, it still almost goes beyond words that I'm able to explain, but there was something that was so true and sacred that I was able, able to honor in a space of presence with him Yeah, uh, that, yeah. that created uh, now the relationship between myself and my father, even though he doesn't have the physical body, it's stronger than ever. Like I can still feel that presence and guidance and know that the love is there. That's right. right. And it's, it's fascinating because I think it's, I think it's Paul check of all people I hear talk about when he's talk, when he asks doctors or, or scientists, well, if, if everything that is truth is measurable, what about do you love? Do you love oh, your wife? Yeah. How do you measure that? How do you quantify <laughs> that? Because you can't quantify it. Is it not true? Well, it's ultimately the most true thing for most people in their lives. Right. And so uh, to, to really step in, to these, I would say, these portals for death, birth, uh, I, I, it feels to me like this is the foundation. And I, I would love to hear your, your thoughts on this. It feels like this is the foundation for a reclamation of, I would say, a deeper level of not just certainly in, sh in shifting the medical paradigm, yes, but something that's deeper on an individual level as well, uh, to really reclaim our sense of self on a on a, a spiritual, emotional, physical level and integrating all of that uh, because we have really lost our ability to accept mortality and accept the nature of life and death and the harmonious cycle that they play with one another, we have lost the, the true sense of self in the, yeah. in the, the purest sense of the word. Well, let's talk about from mortality. We have this fear of mortality. Why do we have the fear? You know, I, I'm, I'm studying for my hospice boards now and, um, and they have all this language around helping a person accept their mortality. And so the question is not why are people afraid of, of dying? The question from the academic standpoint is how can we make them not afraid of it? But they're asking, it's the right question, but it's coming from the wrong place. 
So for the same reason that women are choosing to have births outside of a hospital, they don't see this as a medicalization or, or a, as a medical procedure. They think that it's over pathologized in the hospital system. Likewise with death, we haven't gotten there yet. Although most people will say, I don't want to die in a hospital because in a hospital, that's where sick people go. And you're not, dying does not, is not equitable to being sick. Mm. Dying is at the end of the road, you, you know, <laughs> the, the end of the road, this linear life that we, that we think about in, on earth, it gives you this opportunity as a non-physical thing to experience those uh, emotions, let's say the gravity of being human that can only be experienced in flesh. So we have these emotions. We have the anguish of losing somebody we love. We have the, the desperation of uh, having a child in the hospital. Um, we get fear. We have guilt for what we did wrong to our, you know, our dad. You know, we said that nasty thing to him, whatever. We have all these emotions that perhaps we're not really able to experience in the spiritual world. It doesn't matter if that's true or not. But let's, because this is where the philosophy, medical philosophy has fallen out of the way and has given way to a protocolized linear experience of just the physical while we're here getting treatment for diseases and whatnot. So if, if we can ask, why are we afraid of dying? It's probably, my guess is that we've been conditioned to think that this is linear and physical. You become less fetal and then you become more fetal and then you, you poop out and then you die. Mm. To take this one step further, if that is the only thing that happens, then why are people so determined to not be buried in the ground and to become worm food? So it's not so much that people don't get it or that they don't think that there's more to the physical because they, just like me as a little kid, had some connection with something, a squirrel, a dog, a butterfly. Their father passed away and now a hawk flies over the house every single day. And that was like a bird he was always looking out for. And we never saw it until he died. And now it's here all the time. I mean, we all have these little stories we tell. If it was true that people weren't truly uh afraid of it, that they were truly afraid of dying because the physical is the, is the only thing, then why wouldn't they be more comfortable with like, hell, it's just a meat suit, just throw it in the ground. I don't care. But instead, what do we do, Evan? Mm. We embalm them. We make them look beautiful again, you know, a beauty, whatever that even means. Mm. We put them in a lead lined casket wearing their nicest suit with jewelry and all this other shit. And then we put them into a, a, a concrete tomb, six foot you know, six feet below the ground, two meters from the next person over. And that is where you lay. That is where dad is. So there is some element of this that is probably racked up, rack, wrapped up, at least in our country, in Christian, you know, cosmologies about, you know, the sanctity of, of life and everything else. But I actually think people feel more deeply than that. And when we give per people permission to feel into those spaces, whether it was your father giving you permission to feel into that with him and allowing you to connect with him and for you to give him permission to leave, which I remember you mentioned, which was such a beautiful story. Um, there is more to this, obviously, than the physical. We as a society have just become conditioned to be afraid of this because it seems like it's lights out and that's it. But we've all had little, little glimpses of things, whether it's through prayer, meditation, psychedelics, you know, accompanying a person at the, at the beginning of life and birth or at the end of life in death, we've all had glimpses and we know that there's more to it, which is why when we talk about these things, people aren't genuinely confronted by it. They're curious and they're, they're perhaps a little frazzled because of their conditioning, but this is, this is a wide open space to explore. And it doesn't even need to be as metaphysical as a, as, as somebody like maybe Paul Check talks about it. It could just be, you love this person. Are you telling me that when your chemical process stops, that you're never going to see them again? I used to believe that. I used to consider myself atheistic, read all of Richard Dawkins' books and all this stuff and Christopher Hitchens and was really into that. I was like, if we can't prove it, proof, there's that stupid word again. If we can't prove it on a physical, you know, a material level, then it doesn't exist. That was really my thing up until maybe age 21 and um, in college and actually getting some real life experience. But um if, uh, oh, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, if we, if we can appreciate that there's something more, more to this, which we've all had little glimpses of, then, then perhaps we actually, uh, we actually have this, um, 
this opportunity to just make things a lot more rich. I lost my train of thought there. So I'm going to pause and maybe you can bring me back. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And well, I, I really resonate with what you're saying because it does feel like, you know, we are afraid of death, but in, at, in the same light, like you're right. Like people will, um, if anything, I think the, the foundation of it feels like a preservation, like, you know, talking about burying six feet under and you got, you got separation, you got this beautiful casket. It almost feels like a preservation of self on a, on the physical sense and the egoic sense where it's, you know, yeah, we know there's something more, but this experience stops, yeah. right? And there's, there's an attachment to this perceive, like our ability to perceive reality from this body, from this uh, way that we go about things and to, and to acknowledge and actually lean into that, that small knowing, that small inkling that there is something beyond this. There has to be a, an, a, almost an acceptance of death within oneself while you're still alive, right? I, I had um, somebody I saw on Instagram post, I, I think it was Emma Zek, that's her name. She posted, she's a, and she does like poetry. She put, I've been to many funerals this past year and all of them were my own, right? And it's talking about that. Oh, I saw project. that. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. Um, yeah. and I, I think the to go through life and really embrace this this knowing of what and not even necessarily a knowing of exactly what it is because you know it's it's like the idea of enlightenment the second you speak of it you're outside of it like when something is beyond the rational physical uh, existence our words aren't going to exactly encapsulate it and capture what this experience is so we're never going to truly have that the mind at ease, I am 100% certain in what this next step is. And I, I think that's what, you know, really scares yeah. a lot of people. But we can, it shatters a sense of self, in my opinion, and the identity that we really uh, attach to within this physical uh, plane. I, I've actually been thinking about this so much. And I remembered you, you actually jogged from my memory where the point I was going to make, which is that mm-hmm. my wife and I met when we were 15 mm-hmm. and it became actually more frustrating for me when she said to me, we're now in our late thirties. We met when we were 16 and she had said to me, like, I was like 18. She said, so you mean to tell me that like, if you really love me or somebody in the future, like we were still kids. That means that when you die, that there is nothing more. You will never see them again. You will never see any of these other people again. Whether or not that's true, she actually put me into a bit of a quandary. Am I more, am I, do I feel more content with the idea that I'm going to be eaten by worm food or not if they bury me in a casket like that, at least not right away? Um, or am I more content with, with the idea that, oh, maybe there is something more to this. Because when my wife was like, it, it's very sad for me to think that I'm going to invest all of my love into you and that I'm going to let you into my most vulnerable spaces and that it's just going to be lights out one day. Like, what's the point of love? Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, fuck, you got me there. Like, I, I, it, was, it, was an, it was a very juvenile conversation, but my wife continues to be like 50 years more experienced <laughs> than I am spiritually and, and emotionally. So, so to go back to what you were saying, um, and, and in that lens, we were watching Game of Thrones last night, or one, one recent night, and they were preparing a dead body, and it was a main character's body. And, uh, you know, the maester or whatever says, the body will be ready within a matter of hours or something. Mm-hmm. And my wife said, you know, she paused it. She was like, for some reason, it seems weird. She's like, I get it. I get that the soul is separate and there's this body there. But she's like, it just sounds so weird to me to say, the body and not because she was saying like oh that's cousin joe or whatever we need to call him cousin joe she's like i get that like it's not cousin joe there is something that leaves but it just sounds so weird to me to refer to it as the body and then when i was thinking back to all of the times people died in the hospital even family members would say let's take the body like like can we get rid of the body mm-hmm. so if we so so i'm going to challenge you in a little bit here you know in a, in a small way if what you're saying is true, which is what I always believed as well, is that we, you know, it's like that Seek Up song by Dave Matthews, which is a perfect like background song for this conversation. 
all of that stuff you take to the grave that means it means nothing. So why are we investing all of our time and energy into that? There is some degree of like, okay, there must be something about our desire to to remain married to the to the uh, to the permanence of our body. You know, like there's something important about the meat suit. Let's keep the meat suit. And I would say that there is that that it is true. Like you are gifted with this incredible body. On the other hand, if what you're saying is entirely true, then why don't we have much reverence for the dead body mm. after death? Because what happens, Evan, right, right away when somebody dies? I had one guy that I went into, and I had gone to know this guy. I was in fellowship in San Diego, and I got to know him so well. We'll call him Bill. I went to see Bill after like months of getting to know this guy. He was a former artist and a poet, and he was a pastor. Like he had this incredible rich story, and he was like, you know, withering away from pancreatic cancer. And the one day I went in, his nephew was his primary character. He was like, you know, cousin Bill is, is like, or, or uncle Bill's been looking forward to seeing you. And I went in and he had just been with cousin Bill, his uncle, or I'm sorry, uncle Bill, his uncle. And I went in there and I looked at him and immediately I was like, I think he just passed away. Like if he was alive 15 seconds ago, he's not alive now. And, you know, you just get this fun, like this chill that kind of goes over you. And we listened to his carotid and my attending was like, yeah, I think you're right. He just passed away. And it was like this little quivering of the pulse in his carotid and then it stopped. And like, that was it, it was done. And so this family, very religious, they're the same ones that are gonna be burying the body in the casket and everything I described. They were immediately on phone, on the phone with the mortuary. We gotta get this dead body out of here. So on one hand, you're right. On the other hand, we're not really, it, the way that we manage death, that we, that we show up for death is, uh, it's, it's morbid, it's gruesome. But it doesn't reflect that this body needs to be honored, even though that's what we seem to sort of convey when we want to be buried with all of our jewelry. You see what I mean? Like it's a yeah. it's a strange tension there between these two these two concepts. So, um, yeah. Anyways, <laughs> it's, it's 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 very like paradoxical in a way. Absolutely, it does. Absolutely. It feels like the way we live, in the way that we actually go about our lives, it is that attachment to body, and I think that really, you know, we look at our medical system and we look at a lot of the technological increases and we look at things like transhumanism and tech, all of these developments in the science and material realms. I think a lot of it comes from this quest for immortality and the avoidance of death. And, you know, I think maybe you're right that immortality in a sense, that idea of immortality, mm. it doesn't have to extend to the body because something i'm thinking about now and just came to mind when you're speaking is you know i have done a lot of conversations with james tawney on transhumanism and sort of this this quest to extend life but a lot of that in the technological space it doesn't pertain to the body at all if anything you go at somebody who wants to i don't know go into transhumanism for example and wants to have this Im immortal life they have to get rid of the body and they go into the computer space, right? Exactly. And they create the, yeah. the digital, the digital yeah. reality. And that becomes yeah, like a hard drive that is Evan. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. And they capture that. And you ultimately let go of this, this finite structure of the body, right? So I think maybe there's, there's almost a disregard, even while, and you know, if we were to treat the body as sacred while living, you know, why right. are we so chronically unhealthy? Why is it there's mm. such a large percentage of the population that's overweight, obese? You know, we have all of these diseases that are on the rise, and you know, we don't have a sacred healing process for that's our a body. Great point. That's a right? great point. I'm going to put that into my vernacular. Yeah, that's a really, really great point. If it's so sacred, why do we, why do we, you know, abuse it so much? And that's not judgment. That's just a mere observation. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so it, it feels in what you just described in terms of how we treat the body after it dies. I think that's the same way we treat it as it, as it's alive in a lot of, in a lot yeah. of different ways. And yeah. if, there, if there was a sacred honoring, I look at, you know, there's a lot of cultures, Central and South America that have celebrate and, you know, they celebrate with the body upon death, right? They'll sit with the body for days after yeah. a person dies, right? And there's a reverence that's had for the death process in particular. Right. And I, I think oftentimes we only associate the reverence and the sacred and the beauty with birth, even if it is in a hospital setting. Right. You can still yeah. see when the baby is born 
and it's hard to not get teared up when you're when you have a brand new baby that just arrived yeah (laughs) right and it, it even in an over pathologized setting you still see that sacred you still see that reverence it's yeah. But we, I don't think we see that in the same way with death, especially with the way we treat the body and we run from it. And there's, there's a sense of escapism that I think w- that has just been ingrained uh, mm. from, the, from the very moment that we're born, right? Because death is something that everybody knows. Everybody knows it's coming eventually, but how many people are willing to truly, uh, I guess, sit with it in moments that uh, go out, go outside when you're confronted with it directly. Like, cause if, if somebody we know dies, obviously we're going to have to sit with it then, but are we right. willing to, are we willing to go into the space of, well, what is death when it's not directly mm. in our faces and explore mm. that, that portal and make it a rite of passage. Cause I think it can be a rite of passage for us to step into. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, I hadn't really applied this this sort of thought pattern to birth, but I think it equally applies. If you consider how much time we waste, I'm using air quotes on my end, that we waste avoiding death mm-hmm. and how much better that time, those resources, that energy and focus could be spent, so to speak. And of course, there sounds like there's a little judgment here. I'm just conjecturing everybody. If instead of running from death, what if we put that energy to embracing death? Mm-hmm. And we, and we honored it as a privilege that, hey, you were born here for the purpose of dying. You get the privilege of dying someday. And from now until then, it's your time to experience, to love, to, <laughs> to explore your way through this earth school. And um, with knowing that you eventually get the privilege of being freed from this vessel. But while you were here, like you got to really experience. It's kind of like being shot up into outer space. Like you... If you survive the trip, you're going to get back to, to earth and get to rebuild some muscle and get back onto solid ground. While you're up there, I'm sure that months on end at the space station is probably not the most fun thing, but you get to see earth as the pale blue dot from, from out your, you know, the back window or whatever this whole time. So there's this give and take. The way that the transhumanists and whatnot seem to act is, that, is as if like we're going to outsmart this whole process. And instead of focusing their energy on the value of having a future death, they're instead running desperately in the other direction. It's also that anti, the anti-aging, the biohacking, like I do some of that stuff, but what are you really trying to accomplish? What if you, instead of spending all of that time on those tricks to outsmart nature, so to speak, what if you actually spent it on leaning into the, the reality that this is going to come to an end? And that maybe your son someday is going to be sitting next to your bedside. That's really, I think, where the magic happens. And really, you could apply that to birth as well. Everybody focuses so much on avoiding things in birth when they really could be focusing on that connection with their partner, connection with their baby. And when you're paying attention, you can communicate absolutely with the soul of a baby, your baby inside of a, a, a womb. I did it with my own, my own little girl. And I was like, holy shit, another validating piece that like there is more beyond the veil than I was, I was taught in my textbooks. Um, but really leaning into that is hard work when you've been conditioned to just see this as a linear thing. And that the longer that moment gets away, the, the more real it seems that it'll never happen. And of course, that's, we're, we're fooling ourselves. Um, I just think that we, we absolutely can reframe our notions of death as a privilege, as opposed to a punishment mm. for getting older. Right. Absolutely. A natural part of the cycle uh, yeah. that, that we chose to come and experience, right? Because I mean, death, we hear all of the near death experience encounters and people say, oh, why did you bring me back? Right. Yeah. Why, why yeah. did you bring yeah. me back here? And, you know, going it was to- so fucking great. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Why? Uh, let me step into it. Right. And, uh, you know, from those in, uh, stories alone, I mean, that tells you that it's not something to fear. It's not something that we need to actually run away from and escape because, you know, I recognize that even within myself, when I, I, you know, I'm I'm still young, I don't have health problems. I've never had the, you know, the the confrontation with my own mortality in the sense of like, it's at the doorstep. I've had a couple moments where it's like, oh, I almost fell when I was up on a mountain and like it got into a car accident. So you have those brushes of like, oh, that could have been a close call. Um, 
but even within myself in those moments, uh, I remember, I guess this is, it was a closer call than I realized if I had fallen and I don't know if I would have died, but I go, I was climbing in the badlands of South Dakota and badlands national wow. park. Yeah. And I got, I got wedged between two rocks trying to get down from this, like this peak that we have, me and one of my friends went up to. And so all the rocks are slipping around me. It's probably about a 15, 20 feet fall. And if I fall, there's going to be rocks that come and fall on top of me. And I'm sitting in it and I'm like, well, I'm going to really need some assistance to get out of here. Oh, but, but, if I, <laughs> but if I fall, like, can I accept that? Can I be present with that? And obviously it's not ideal, but I noticed at first the mind is racing, the this and that. And I'm like, none of the panic actually helps. This is, there's a fear of the end result. If I were to fall, that is manifesting. Huh? I thought I had worked with death. I thought I was over my fear of death. I thought I wasn't so attached to this life. Right. But once, and once I sort of could just be present, it disappeared. And I was able to just kind of, you know, get assistance, get on out of there. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. But even in yeah. those moments where I was confronted with it, there was still that, that hesitation of, oh, I don't want that right now. Like that, no, like go away, that, no, no, can't have that. And so obviously I think life is sacred and to be celebrated. And when you're up on a mountain, and you're going to fall, they'll just fall to your death if you have an opportunity to live, certainly. But I think that that fear is still so present and ingrained within us because I think naturally we fear the unknown and what we don't understand it's a survival Beautiful. instinct you know it's it, naturally we have we're going to have our fight or flight instincts we're going you know our body is built to preserve itself and survive and it's like all right well how do we when we live in a system that is constantly triggering the fight or flight instinct when we live in a world that is constantly uh, putting the pressure on us to to survive, but not thrive and actually live and harmonize and experience. Yeah. How can we actually yeah. step into this? And it, it's, it's tough because it, it does, I think, require an individual detachment from the way we're conditioned just to view ourselves and the way we're conditioned to view the world in its totality. If we actually want to, uh, I would say, rewrite our internal story on yeah. death and how we actually act that out and, and have a relationship with it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, these are the big, these are the big questions that we, you know, and I think the reason it's so much fun to talk about is we don't really, we don't really know. Yeah. Although I will say that many of us have had little glimpses behind that curtain. And uh, like you said, you know, we have these people that come back from near death experiences and whatnot. It's invariably a positive experience for them. And uh, there was there's a woman named Edith Ubuntu Chan. I don't know if you know her name, but she's an acupuncturist. She's a pretty rad lady. She talks a lot about conscious conception and the energetics of healing. And she's working in the private like I am. And um, on my podcast, she told a story, which she has told in other interviews, but she told this story about getting really deep into to a practice, a Tai Chi or Qigong practice is what she was doing. And um, while she was in acupuncture school and she went way beyond the curriculum she like kind of she like went deep it was like you need to do an hour a week and she was doing like 10 hours a week or something oh, wow. and she was going way deeper and she got so into this practice that at some point when she became super comfortable and and uh intentional with it that she found herself in a you know i would call it a psychedelic experience but she experienced herself exploding into a trillion pieces of light mm. and love and being able to see, you know, who Edith was from afar. And she's like, I, you know, I, she's using language, you know, how hard it is to describe yeah. like a mushroom journey or LSD experience. But she's like, I saw Edith. And then I had at some point I was, I was like bathed in love. Like I could, I could be like this forever. But then she realized at some point you have to go back in. And she went back in. And she described it, I, I will, I'm paraphrasing, so I, I forgive me, Edith, if you're listening, I got this mm -hmm. wrong, but she did describe it as sort of a depressive period for her. I won't say she was in full-blown depression, but it was like, oh my gosh, I have to continue to live in this body, but I felt that. Now that I felt that, how could I possibly 
be content with this. And she was kind of stuck in this juxtaposition. Well, she's worked her way through and integrated that experience. But when we listen to these experiences, there is, a, there is something true about it. And how do we know it's true? Because Edith experienced it. That's actually all that matters. How do I know? I was there. Exactly. So, you know, going back to like, you know, Sir Francis Bacon, we can be deceived by our senses. They're the most easily fallible, you know, measuring organs that we have. We can't use our perceptions to understand the physical world. I call baloney because that's actually all that you have. You've got your head, you've got your heart, and you've got your solar plexus. And that's really this, this circuitry is really where you're sensing those, those special sensing organs lie. And when you have those experiences, I think it is very easy to brush them aside because of our conditioning. Mm. But many of us get, I think, get to the end and they, we actually just need permission to go because we all know, I think, deep down that this is probably not scary, a scary hell or something that we're going to through the lens of the Protestants and Catholics. It's probably way better than that. And even if we don't know, it's okay. It's okay that we ask, but running away from it doesn't make it you know, any, yeah. any easier at the very end. Absolutely. Well, that reminds me of a dream I had where I experienced all of a, a whole bunch of different past lives and deaths. I remember being oh burned. I remember being burned alive in one of them and then having oh. all of these different sensations. And I remember at the very end of this dream, I had this sort of this, this view of earth, right? And I was looking at the earth and its totality. And I was just in my soul. I wasn't in my body. I didn't have form. And throughout these different lives, I had different forms <laughs> that went beyond human. It was a fascinating experience. That's awesome. Yeah. But um, I remember looking at the world and then I saw the picture of like, it was my family and sort of, you know, I was given this information about a purpose to come back and really experience life once again. But there was such bliss and content in <sighs> just being beyond the body, beyond the identity, just to, to just uh, be in this almost formless awareness and consciously present with that, uh, that I remember having resistance of, oh, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back in there. And it's like, no, it'll be fine. And it said, and there was this voice that came in and said, open your eyes. And immediately when I did that, I opened my eyes. I was back awake mm -hmm. in the body. And, you know, I, that was, a, there was almost that depressive period after that you just mentioned with Edith, where it's like, oh, I need to re really integrate that experience. Yeah. But there's so yeah. much that exists beyond this, this, this form that we're so used to. And, yeah. you know, to me, it, I, I almost think of, um, you know, Terrence McKenna used to talk about this idea of an archaic revival for the times we're in. Mm -hmm. I think you could look at the collective at large and you know, I guess, depending on your perception, you could label this as we're, we're walking right hand in hand into a mass death portal, like it's possible, or we're, we're laying the groundwork for our extinction. But in the same breath, Terrence McKenna talked about how we're in the, we're in the womb of creation right now, right? And we're, we're kind of going through the birthing process and the contractions are happening. The, the way that we're Com the womb that we're comfortable within, like we got to exit it. We have yeah. to leave it. We have to be, go into that next stage of light, right? When the baby's being born and it sees the light from its comfortable wound, what do you, it's the same thing. What do you, what, yeah. it doesn't know what it's experiencing necessarily, right? And so it, it feels to me like, yes, we could be, you could label this as a death experience, but it also feels like we're being reborn into something that's much larger than the individual self. And I heard somebody say that the word matrix itself, you know, we live in this matrix reality that translates to mother, right? Mm. So mm. we're, if we're within the matrix, and, and womb, womb, yeah, Patrice, yeah exactly. Yeah. And so we're being born in outside of this matrix system. Like maybe that was, this was always here to hold us in this specific space for this specific reason so that we can have the experiences that we've been having and be born into this, this new path, this new <laughs> way, right? And um, it is I a think... fascinating connection there. I had never made the connection with the word matrix, but yeah, that's Latin for mother, mm -hmm. if I recall. Yeah. And matriz is the word um, in Spanish. I believe that's the word for womb. So now you've got my, you've, you've, 
congrats. You got my head spinning a little bit. That's <laughs> interesting. I was going to say never um, necessarily a bad thing to have the head spinning, but you know, and I, yeah. I, I feel like, you know, we, 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 that word matrix gets thrown around a lot nowadays and, you know, we're, you know, exit, a lot of people want to exit the matrix and then sort of live in this, this new space. And I, I'd look at the work that you're doing, right. And you've yeah. been able to really create a sacred practice that does honor life, death. It honors the totality of the individual, mm-hmm. whether, you know, in the physical emotional, spiritual, and really a full integration, you know, I see that and what you're doing as an embodiment of living outside the matrix, right? And I think, I think it's representative of what it is that we're actually moving towards and really the inevitability, because this birth process, it is going to happen regardless, right? Right. The The mother's going to give birth to us. And it's like, are we going to step in? Are we going to lean gracefully into it and, you know, accept the chaos that comes with it and the unknowns and the uncertainties, or are we going to resist it? Right. And if there's a resistance that's long enough and, you know, it, it, that only, when that, I guess when that resistance is present, I'm, I'm sure you've seen this in your practice, you know, that hurts the mother, that hurts the baby, right. That, that creates turmoil and and chaos. Right. So I, I think it can be helpful to look at that on an individual level and really Im- embody that and I guess lean into uh, mm. a, a rebirth, you know, and psychedelics have, are certainly one way to experience that if somebody wants an actual uh, physical experience. Yeah, but. yeah. I, uh, I want to bring up something that you've probably heard a little bit about, but I want to apply it in maybe a different lens. Have you heard about the basic perinatal matrices by Stan Groff? Yeah, yeah, a little bit. So Stan Groff, of course, he and, and Joan Halifax, who's now a Tibetan monk, nun, whatever they would call it, um, they were they were experimenting, experimenting with LSD at the end of life. There's an incredible book, if you can get your hands on it. It's called The Human Encounter with Death, I believe is the name. And it talks about Groff and Halifax, their work with LSD at end of life as a, as a means of treating existential pain. That is the fear of what happens after, what's going to happen to me. And that is actually one of the most prominent um, types of pain and death. But this gets better because we are talking about birth and death. Groff also had some theories around the embodiment of the human organism with the, these energetic bodies that I've described, the mental, the emotional, the spiritual, or Steiner's worldview, the etheric, the astral, and the eye on top of your physical mineral body. So you've got this baby growing inside of you. And he conjectured that, okay, the baby is at one time is smiling, cozy, cuddly inside of the amniotic universe. Growing, there's plenty of space, flipping, spinning, ask any mom, and they've felt that. Then it starts running out of room. And actually the uterus starts actually squeezing the baby. So now there's this oppressive, force, this cosmic oppressive force, as Groff describes it. This is the second matrix. Mm -hmm. It's this, it's, it's oppressive. It's squeezing. There is absolutely no way out. And this baby starts to become a little bit frightened. Then the cervix begins to open. And this baby is now being nudged towards that light. This is the, the, the matrix that he describes as the struggle between death and rebirth. And then the fourth matrix is the experience. This is this experiencing the death and rebirth. When the baby is out, the baby's got this umbilical cord that's been cut and the baby's out in the world. So in the process of being born, born through this tight pelvis, these cosmic oppressive forces are actually an important part of embodying the human with, um, with these energetic bodies, these more subtle energetics. And um, and that should that should cause us to pause because then we consider what happens at death. And this is not I'm not the first time to bring this to your to your attention, I'm sure. But think about that. You're you're being oppressed. And then suddenly, like maybe you're it's becoming harder to breathe at end of life. You know, you've got all these things, and then suddenly this portal opens and you go towards that, and then you experience death and rebirth again. So I always ask people, what comes first? The birth of a baby or the death of the baby? Like, I don't know maybe the reverse, maybe this birth is actually the end of something and death is the beginning. But the reason I brought all this up is that 
uh, Charles Eisenstein, who I'm sure you know of, he's a mentor and friend of mine. Mm -hmm. He brought this to my attention when I was sitting at his table in his, in his kitchen, we were having coffee and he was like, you know, Stan Groff's perinatal matrices align perfectly with what we're going on, what's going on in the world. We've got these oppressive forces, you know, for, at one point there's this amniotic universe, you're happy, you're flipping, you're doing your thing. And then suddenly the walls start closing in and you're, and you're feeling like I am, I've got to go out of here. I can't stay in here for long. And then suddenly boop, a portal opens and you walk through what we've been going through these past couple of years, and especially what we're seeing with people saying things like, I'm going to leave, I'm going to fuck the matrix, you know, break out of the matrix, red pill, blue pill, all this other stuff, right? which I, I think is fun. It's also how I live my life is I want to be as free as possible from um, oppressive forces that are going to prohibit my personal and spiritual interpersonal growth. Mm. But when we talk about what's been happening over the past couple of years, I think Charles actually fucking nailed it. Like we have an opportunity now to be reborn. What do we want this next phase to look like? We actually have all of the tools right now to determine that. And part of that is perhaps breaking free from the matrix. But now that you've brought the word matrix and mother together, it makes me wonder like breaking free from the matrix to the transhumanists might mean we're going to upload ourselves into a server and we're going to end up on Mars completely detached from all those trees that I connected to when I was a kid. You know, you get my point. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be very, very, I think, deliberate with our language that, that what is it that we're breaking free of in death? What are we breaking free of in birth? And what are we breaking free of as a collective? That's, I think, where we can really start to play with this and ask ourselves, what's really important to me? To be an isolated hermit out in the woods, free of the matrix? Or is it that we perhaps break free of the matrix in the sense that we break free of this conditioning that this me and you don't matter, that this is just a, a podcast that's going to bring in whatever views or whatever, like perhaps breaking free from the matrix for many people out there could mean not only are you not afraid of birth and death, but you're also going to be a little bit more comfortable with breaking free from the conditioning that is prohibiting you from seeing these things as sacred rites of passage, from seeing your inherent inextricable link with you, with nature out there and in here. And that might actually be where the magic is um, mm. from the lens of Groff and Eisenstein and, and everything we've kind of talked about. I, I really, that actually is actually far more optimistic than me, to me than any of the, than a lot of other theories. Uh, absolutely. And I agree with you completely. And it's fascinating because I recently made the connection between, I look at like the concepts of Zen, right? Just the idea of Zen and exiting mind. Look at the concepts of transhumanism. They're, they're eerily similar in terms of what is the, what is the goal, right? And the methods of just reaching these states of uh, beyond body, beyond mind, you know, you're exactly right in that we need to be very conscious about what are the methods that we're going to right. use to create this new path forward? What is it exactly that we are, uh, what is it exactly that our hearts desire in the, in this world, in this embodiment, in this mm. physical experience? Do you, does your heart truly desire to be uploaded to a computer and to, to blast off into outer space and, and, and never be in connection with the earth, right? Or, you know, for me, detaching from the matrix and, and, and lifting the veil, it's, it's really just lifting the veils of illusion that have been placed over my own eyes through the conditioning, through yeah. the programming, right? It's as simple as that. There isn't uh, oftentimes in our decision-making, very rarely is it so black and white that you have one right, you have one wrong, and you need to go down this one path to exit the matrix or do this. We live in such a world of gray and such a world that is dynamic that, you know, as long as we tune in to the calling of the heart, there isn't necessarily going to be a right or wrong. Certainly we, right. we, we understand what it is based on our moral frameworks. That almost goes without saying, but you know, I, it, I can, I can understand. And I, I've had conversations with friends of mine who are, who define themselves as transhumanist and they're really into the technological merger between man and, 
AI and the potentials of that and their reasons for doing so are, are, are similar to the reasons that I want to reconnect with nature and go out into the forests and, you uh, know, have these have journeys and, and explore. Right. And so it's, it's like, what do we ultimately want and how do we, how do we, how do we not even necessarily achieve that, but how do we embody that? And I think it's really, uh, telling because at the end of the day, a lot of us want the same thing, even if we are on perceived opposite polarities of this spectrum, right? When you go far yeah. enough, either way, you end up at the exact same place. Nothing is truly linear. So, um, and I, I, I think, I, you know, go, go for no, it. Go no, for sorry. It. No, go ahead. I was just going to add that as you're saying that I'm getting like more and more excited. Like I, I, I love this guy. Like he's got these great ideas. It's going to be so much fun to explore more of this stuff with you. And I know that when you're my age, <laughs> so that's the first time I've ever said that to a grown man. When you're my <laughs> age, um, I'm not that old, but you know, you're you've come to some of these conclusions so early in your life. How old are you? Are you again? 26, 26, 27? 27 in a few yeah. months. Right on. H happy soon to be birthday. Um, uh, when I think about that. What I think is most people who know you and that are listening to your show are maybe doubtful about this conversation. What I want to acknowledge for people is that a part of that conditioning that perhaps has prevented you from either feeling secure in looking outside of the bounds or a feeling perhaps like it's complete baloney is that when you stand in, like when you, when you step up and put on adult pants, and you can lose the, this childlike behavior to always need somebody to tell you what's coming next, what you should be looking forward to, how you should be spending your time. If you can shed that, it actually opens the opportunity for you to learn a great, great deal about yourself in the world. But it comes with an important responsibility, which is that when you make a decision as an adult, there's nobody there to really save you from those decisions. That is actually the human experience. Mm -hmm. If you're not making decisions, and owning the outcomes, good or bad. Um, you're not a man, you're not an adult. And that's okay, that's not an insult. It is that your conditioning has taught you that from the moment you were born in grade school, you have to raise your hand to go pee. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward, and now if you wanna live here, you have to pay a property tax. And if you own a vehicle, you have to pay a tax on that and you have to do all these other things. That's fine, you can do those things. But it's important to reflect back on the fact that you actually don't need to do anything anybody asks you to do. The only two common law principles are don't hurt people and don't break their shit. Mm -hmm. That is actually the only two real laws. All of this other stuff that you've been taught has to be followed is actually prohibiting you from making decisions for yourself. And once you start making decisions for yourself, you also have to own those outcomes which is one of, I think that is probably, Evan, the, the most important um, growth point that most people struggle to get over. And it comes very quickly with parenting, but even people who become parents don't realize the gravity of what you're doing. You're bringing a life into the world. And it's unfortunately on you now to keep them safe for the rest of their lives. And that's not going to be told to you by a state that says you have to do this mandatory Thing. I won't say things mm -hmm. like that. Um, it, or, or somebody telling you that your kid has to pass these tests or whatever else. It's your child. You are, are owning the outcomes here. And nobody's going to save you from that experience. But that's also when you have the utmost respect for personal responsibility, you start to climb this very steep mountain. And um, and you really become unstoppable because there's nobody that can get in my way anymore. I don't feel like people can get in your way. No. They could put me in jail. It doesn't matter. I won't, I'll do fine in jail. Like it, it's really, you guys have absolutely no control how I show up in the world. I just have to shift my, my perception. Yeah. I end up behind bars or whatever. But um, so anyways, I, I'm curious what you think about that because you are young and you have a lot of really powerful people that you've been communicating with, including Paul and, and, and whatever. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, it, I mean, it deeply resonates. Something I remember coming across a few years ago was this, it was a phrase, it was, you cannot be a victim of your own choices. And I remember reading that for the first time and I was like, wow, 
I definitely like to play the victim of my, you know, I, I, it, it was sort of a wake up call to recognize that where I am in this exact moment, it is all the buildup of every single choice that I've ever made in my entire life manifested here and now present, right? And it's like, am I willing to actually sit in that and own that and take responsibility for that, the good and bad, perceived good and bad, whatever it may be, right? And, you know, I've definitely had to learn through my choices what it means to feel pain and heartbreak and the and self-induced trauma, things of that nature, right? And really go down the path of, uh, well, that wasn't the greatest choice I could have made, <laughs> right? Um, yeah. But it's yeah. been very liberating to accept the fact that where I am is where I am. And there's a lot of beauty in that because what that means is moving forward, I am the only one who is going to create my reality. I am the only one who has control over how I show up in the world, like you were talking about. For better or for worse. Yeah, right. it's still on you, Evan. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and there's such, you know, for me, that's what it truly means to be free. You know, I think freedom is certainly you have the external freedoms. Obviously, we don't want to be jailed. We don't want things mandated on us. We don't want this. Like, right, of course, there is a level of external freedom that is necessary to fight for and, and really, you know, make it a point to preserve. But at the same time, true freedom, true liberation, when you can take the flight, like it's like the bird leaving the nest for the very first time, flying on its own. You know, that is an internal step that you have to take when you oh, truly yeah. leave the nest, right? And there's certain birds that the mother will kick the bird out of the nest. And if the bird doesn't fly, well, it's just going to fall to the ground and it's going to die. It's not going to, you know, it's going to splat. It's going to hit the ground. So, you know, and I think in our society, maybe we don't have that gentle nudge. We don't have that little push for us to take that flight into liberation. Although I think it's what every single person who may be feeling unfulfilled or may be feeling uh, a sense of purposelessness, purposelessness, or maybe a hopeless feeling, whatever it may be, a lot of our unfulfilled feelings come from that craving for deeper liberation and to actually radically take responsibility for themselves and their own path and the direction that they're moving in. I, I think that's the root of our our illusions and our, the myth of separation that we play out, the, the stories that we tell one another, it all comes from that, that lack of inner liberation and freedom to just be oneself authentically and, yeah. and bring the beauty from that to, the, to others around, right? Because you being yourself authentically, mm -hmm. you taking a flight of liberation, just the act of doing so is going to inspire others to do the same and, you know, take hands with you and walk that path. Right. That's, that's all it yeah. takes. Yeah. So, yeah, I've always thought of, you know, I've always thought back to, and by the way, what you just said is literally something I have said to everybody from Mark Groves to Josh Trent, to Paul Check to Kyle Kingsbury, to like all of my friends, like, I appreciate you for showing up authentically because that gives me permission to be my authentic self. And that there is power in who I am. There's not power in me pretending to be somebody I'm not. Exactly. shaving my head, putting on some hemp t-shirts and toe shoes and showing up and saying, look, I'm just like Paul Check." Like Paul would be like, get the fuck out of here. I'm Paul Check. <laughs> I've heard him say that to people, you know? Um, so when people show up authentically as themselves, it gives us permission to stand in our own power and truth. And there, there is some real, uh, there is some real, um, I don't uh, we're using the word power a lot, but there's, there's a lot, there is true power in being yourself because there's only one of you. And what I always think about is the reason that I feel so confident sharing that with people, that type of language is that if you look at any TV show, movie or whatever that we've grown up watching, um, there's always like the heroine, uh, the, the hero and the anti-hero. And oftentimes the hero is the person that we don't even expect. It's like the cheerleader who stands up for the, for the geek, or it's the, it's the bully who stands up for the, you know, the, I keep saying the geek, I was the geek in school. Yeah. So I just always think about this, but um, you, you know what I mean? It's like the person who doesn't have to actually stand up for this person. They don't need the social, you know, points, the brownie points or anything. They just do it because that's not right. Stop doing that to them. 
that every single person in the world wants to be that person. But 99% of people are afraid because they don't know what mother culture is going to think of them. And when you can shake that apprehension, it really allows you to show up in the world in a different way. So a lot of things that I say on social media and whatnot, it rattles cages. That's okay. I am showing up authentically as me. I am resonating out a specific frequency and people like you who resonate with that frequency, like we're going to make some magic. If not, that's okay. You may not be ready. You may not ever be ready. That's not that's not what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned with finding those people that for whatever reason, I want to be closer to this guy. And that has served me so well since I was fired about a year ago. I, I think I told you I took my mask off at, at, while take, caring for a dying guy. And um, it's against policy, fired on the spot. So fine, I'll start my own thing. And it started with a three-month process of writing a mission statement or a vision statement, we'll call it, not a mission statement. But that vision statement, I worked with this woman on this and I went deeper and deeper and deeper and then eventually came up with the blurb that's on my, my website. And I don't think I'll ever have to change it because it is so congruent with how I want to show up as a doctor, as a father, as a husband, et cetera. And, uh, but I will say that the process of going that deep was in and of itself so confronting. It was really starting to peel the layers of all that calloused cynicism that I developed over the years. But once, man, once you you pare down those those calluses on your heel, whew, that's like fresh baby skin. Like we can work with that, you know. And um, it just feels so good to have been given permission by people to do that. And anybody out there listening, I want you to know you have permission to be you. People like Evan and I are going to love you even more. Mm-hmm. We're not going to dislike you if you don't, but we're going to love you even more. It's going to get juicier. If you can just show up in a way that reflects your internal experience, you know, through the, all those sensing organs, those multi-sensory organs, that's, that's where, that's where the magic is, is, is coming into play in conversations like this. Mm, absolutely. And I think what comes to mind for me is it's important to note too, that that magic that you're talking about, you know, a lot of people, they want to strive for it when the reality is it's already there, just waiting to be recognized. There isn't anything we actually, you know, most of the time that need to do or need to achieve or, right. you know, find some sort of external definition of success. It's already present in this moment. And it just takes that shifting of awareness and the willingness to step into yourself fully, the willingness to be authentic. Maybe it's yeah. in a creative project. Maybe it's in, uh, for me, I like to write a lot of poetry, right? And I, it, I have the, that same process that you just talked about, where sometimes you have to really peel back layers and you have to really feel things. You really have to go through portals of vulnerability in order to access authenticity and truth and who you are. But once you peel back those layers and you continue to do so, and you know, it's not just a one-time process. Certainly there's going to be more points in your life where, you know, you know, it's funny. I was on another podcast yesterday and we were talking about this continuous path of growth. It's like when you tell the universe, Hey, I'm ready for more growth. There's kind of a cosmic giggle in a sense of, (laughs) <laughs> All right, you're ready for more growth. Let me give it you to sure? you. You know, right, exactly. And you're presented with the challenge. You're presented with a, something that is going to test you, and it's going yeah. to uh, require you to peel back more layers, right? And you know, looking at that, the totality of that picture can feel a little daunting. It's like, oh, this is never going to end. There is no destination. There is no, you know, point where I am. Uh, I guess c- complete whole. They feel like we need to achieve that, but. The recognition is, the the true recognition is that we are already complete. We are already whole. We are already divine. And we're just- 100%. We just need to step back and uh, allow that remembrance to take place, right? I think it's it's only our own mind that prevents us from accessing the magic and the beauty uh, that is present, you know? I mean, you look at, if, if you look on TV, uh, the television- the picture you're going to get of reality is going to be so different than mm-hmm. looking outside your window. And, you know, you, the, the illusions that live on the screens and the illusions that live in our perception. And ultimately the system is an internal um, program, right? The way that we've been programmed to relive our lives and you're fighting the system, you're really fighting yourself and your programs. Um, it's so different than the, than the true nature of reality and the beauty that's always present always present it's always there and um that's been a big remembrance for me 
and just to continue to allow that beauty to feed my own processes and decision making and how I choose to show up into the world. It's to to access and remember that beauty, see it within all of us, see it within you, see it within me, see it within this space, see it outside the window, all, all of it. It's always yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to, you know, that time you were in the woods, you know, you're, you probably saw a lot of beautiful things there when I was in the woods when I was a kid, it goes back to just like honoring beauty for, yeah. for what it is. Like it's everywhere. It's all around you. Like get off the, just eliminate the distractions. And I'm not saying get rid of your computers and go live in the woods. I mean, mm -hmm. like just stop with the silly bullshit and really start to hone in on what it is you want, who it is that you want to show up as. And everything else seems to kind of fall into place. If you're a person who loves being on outside, go be outside and like really be outside. Take your shirt off, take your shoes off, take all your clothes off, who cares? And uh, and just like, I don't know, just soak in that experience. And it, it really does, it makes a huge difference when you can just do the things that that serve you. Yeah, absolutely. Because when you can do that and you serve yourself, you inevitably serve others which is you know kind of what we already talked about what people are really craving to do right. they are they want to be of service they want to be that hero and i think we are all on the hero's journey in a lot of ways i've been doing a lot of um interlinking tarot with the hero's journey and really a lot of deep diving into the different archetypes and phases of the hero's journey and i feel like we are sort of in the initiation in a lot of ways we're in the we're, we're in the initiation phase of the hero's journey. So it's like, we've already left the mundane ordinary world behind. It's like, all right, how are we going to show up and play in this new world? And um, there's a lot of beauty when you, when you can tap into that. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I mean, we can, we can create it too. I mean, we can just, what I always tell people that I'm working with, like they haven't had any creative expression for the last 20 years. And I'm like, go to the art store, buy a 12 by 12 canvas, yeah. buy a couple paints, a dark paint, a light paint, and then like a really wacky color. And then like a couple paint brushes and just like spend a day just covering that canvas with color. Yeah. You wouldn't believe what it does for people. It's just that like, we've gotten out, we've gotten so stuck in this modicum of of like linear growth, you know, you make it through your steps of life that you forget to just like stop and play and like look around at how fucking cool everything is. Like what an awesome body I get to have. And I get to have sex and I get to have kids and I get to be yelled at and I get to feel sad. I get to do all of this stuff and I get to like put bright colors on white canvas. Like it's just such a, it sounds so easy, but I think our conditioning has made that so hard. So yeah. I want to thank you for showing up the way you are. Um, in the world, uh, Evan, you have a really special energy to you. And I really, um, I really hope we can get to get to know each other better with time. Absolutely, man. Well, this feels like the, the, the seeds of new beginnings in a lot of ways, right? <laughs> Just a uh, beginning to unfold in this process. And I want to thank you for the same thing, because, you know, I, like I was saying, and I, I mentioned to you at the very beginning, I've never met, you know, beyond just being a doctor, obviously, somebody who is so, um, authentically themselves and holding space in a way for, because, you know, I look at birth and death. Those are two in people's lives. You know, if you have a mother who's giving birth, that's going to be the, an experience that is unlike anything she ever experiences for the rest of her life. It might, it's going to yeah. be the most important transformative experience in her life. Right. And the same thing with death, right. I'm always going to look back at the moment I had with my father as he transitioned as one of the most transformative experiences, right? And for you to hold space in the way that you do within those sacred portals, within those rites of passage, but then into just to, to show up in the way that you do beyond that, it, you know, with your work, with your podcasting, how you, um, you know, cause I was, I, I remember listening to your uh, podcast with Paul check before we got connected on Instagram. I was like, wow, this guy is really like, he, he really shows up. And, uh, so, <laughs> Um, and I want to thank you for that because it's truly a gift. And, you know, with people like you doing the work that you're doing, I have no, I have no doubt and fear ultimately about the direction that we're moving in collectively, right? Because, you know, with the gifts that you're bringing and the awareness that is rising in the, I would say the collective consciousness, uh, it feels like an inevitability the, that the direction we're moving in is going to be based in 
a lot of the concepts that we talked about today the from the heart space ultimately so right um you know I'm, I'm excited to see how it plays out and you know hopefully this is the first conversation of many because we can there's so many ways to continue to explore this and we'll go out in the world and there'll be an integration process after this conversation where we integrate what we learn and then we take that to the world and the world changes us and we come back we have more to share and so it's sort of a forever infinite game in a lot of ways so yeah um, yeah how that plays out i'm excited for it totally yeah i, th I think it's like a final thought I, I just want to share that it's sort of echoing what you're saying which is that you know a lot of people are kind of this uh, they're in a state of despair a lot of a lot of very demoralized people right now very discouraged but i think that it's reasonable to be discouraged and demoralized and to be cynical if you're only immersed in the, 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 the structures that you've been conditioned to rely on, mm. which is our government, our religious leaders, perhaps mom and dad, whatever. Like it was working. It's not working great anymore. And that's why you feel that despair. On my, in, in my worldview, which people may not like this, but my little daughter's rolling around over here right now. Uh. <laughs> um, little, little, uh, little baby. Um, in my world, I think that the past three years and the, the, the sort of universal nudge I needed to be me, to really feel okay, just being me, even if I'm a doctor or whatever, with half a million dollars in med school debt, who cares? Just be me. Um, I feel like the past two to three years were the greatest three years of my life. It was so rich and it was beyond just having kids. It was that I met, I have met so many incredible people doing things through that lens of authenticity that I actually have more hope now than I did before the pandemic, mm -hmm. which is very, very different from what most people's experience was. I didn't lose a, a close family member. So I, I realized that there are a lot of other you know, pieces to this, but it was an opportunity to really, really show up in the way that we've been describing and meeting so many people like you getting closer to the Czech tribe, you know, Kyle Kingsbury is a good friend of mine. And the way that guy shows up in the world as a six foot four giant God of a man, but then gives you the best hugs possible. It's like, there are people like you guys out there. I have absolutely so much optimism and hope, but I've also chosen to make those, to make those transitions and shift my perspective. Um, which is, which is hard, but it, it can be done. And I, f I feel very grateful, Evan, to have connected with you and, and all these other people that we've been jamming on. Absolutely, man. And it's, it's, I always say people come into your life for the reason, like it's, it's divine in its nature, right? You can never plan these connections and how the world unfolds, but yeah. I'm, I'm right there with you because these last few years have been the most fulfilling and meaningful years of my life. And, you know, I think as we continue down this path, we'll look at the next few years and we'll end up saying the same thing, right? Because we're on, yeah. we're on that path. That is the yeah. path we're choosing. So yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome, man. Do you have um, anywhere that you'd want to send the listeners to engage with you and your work? And um, maybe if you have any projects you upcoming or, you know, just things that you wanted to share out and um, yeah, where, where they can go and find you. Yeah, totally. My website, whereas, you know, people can find me for help with everything from fertility to menopause, everything in between. I do comprehensive lifestyle medicine, functional medicine. I'm, I'm on my third board certification, as I mentioned before, but really I'm, I'm all about helping a person on a physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual level achieve vitality. And my doctor tools are helpful because I know how to avoid those tools and how I've, I've been forced to kind of reframe disease, disease, or um, whatever, in, in order to promote healing and vitality through salutogenesis. So I, I work with people personally. I have a collaborator program whereby health coaches can have an MD consultant for a reasonable monthly fee to review anything that, that, that they're coming across in their clinics. Um, I've got a newsletter as well. That's all at belovedholistics.com. Um, what you'll see there is show notes as well from my podcast, which is called the holistic OBGYN. I think Evan, you'd be a really great attribute to my show. If you'd be, um, uh, you know, if you'd, if you'd honor me with that, so we can, okay. can get that figured out in the near future. Um, and, uh, uh, there is one project that I want people to, to, to think about and, and perhaps maybe lend some support. Um, I've had this vision of having a birth and death retreat space. Um, for, many, for, for some time now, and I'm working with indie birth from the birth side, and then I'm going to bring in the hospice side. 
we're going to have birth and death in the same retreat space, grow all of our own food, have all of our own animals, try to do it as an intentional community where people can come to learn how to attend birth if they're midwives or birth workers, or they can come there and have a birth. We're going to have some of the best experts around the world going there to train midwives and breach maneuvers, twins, et cetera. And um, that's called the Indie Birth um, Sanctuary, which you can go to Indie Birth Sanctuary. Let me make sure I have that right. IndieBirthSanctuary.org. Maybe you can just link that in your show notes. Yeah. That'd be a lot of fun to send people there. There's a beautiful little video that I'll, I'll link you to as well, Evan. I think you'd really, really appreciate it given your experiences yeah. with your dad. And, and by the way, thank you for being so willing to, to just open up about some of these scary things. We only get one dad in our lives. And as men having to stand in, you know, it's a, another accelerator to manhood. Thank you for, for sharing your story in, in such a, a candid way. Uh, I really appreciate that. And I, I love hearing those stories. Oh, absolutely, brother. And thank you for the work that you're doing. I'll, I'll put that all in the episode show notes and it would be an honor to come on your show and keep the conversation going. So, you know, I think as long as we continue to sh show up in the way that we're showing up, there's so much beauty that we can learn from one another and tap into. So I'm excited, brother. Thank you. Thank you so much again for coming on the podcast. This was, this was truly phenomenal. Like I, I, there's going to be a deep period of integration for me once, once we're off a of year, I'm going to have to like sit in with it and be like, wow, wow. Phenomenal. Yeah, likewise, likewise. Awesome, man. So thank you all the listeners for tuning on in and uh, we shall see you all on the next episode.